Hello, my name is Nicole Ehrenholt and I work in International Medicine Clinic at Harperview Medical Center in Seattle. And I'm going to be talking today about the impact of torture on medical care. Uh, so, so to start out, we're going to discuss a case of a patient that we have seen in clinic here. Mr. L, who is a 74-year-old man from a Vietnamese minority group uh, speaking through a Vietnamese interpreter who comes today for follow-up of chronic leg pain. He's been seen for this problem many times before, and he describes pain in both legs, particularly associated with numbness, weakness, and difficulty walking. This has been ongoing for years. Uh, he notes that his symptoms get worse when he doesn't sleep well or also when he is hungry. He's been evaluated by this both in primary care uh, as well as in multiple subspecialty clinics, including neurology, rehabilitation medicine, and orthopedics. Uh, and in addition, he's had a fairly unremarkable exam in addition to labs and imaging that were unrevealing. So could you tell me a little bit about, right now, just tell me how your leg feels. Tell me right now what, you, what you're experiencing with your leg. Okay, but you feel numb, is that right? Right. Yes. Okay, and then it also is, hurts in the behind, behind your knee? Just numbness and tingling. And then there was some weakness for a while, but that's better. Okay. Do you have trouble straightening the leg out completely or bending it completely? Do you have any trouble? Yes, I can do that. You can do that now. Okay. When did this problem start? Bắt đầu từ năm 2009 là nó nặng hơn. Trước thì nó tê rồi nhẹ nhẹ đi được. Chân này phải không? Không có. Cùng nhất là nó xong là ban đêm là nó thế dài thế nè. Rồi nó ở ngoài chúng tôi ở trong nhà nó đêm đêm là thằng gạng, thằng cán bộ này giật ở ngoài cho nó đau đấy. Ở ngoài nó đi ở mọi người ở trong người ở ngoài thôi. À, sau khi á, tôi chúng tôi bảo là chúng tôi chỉ có 8 người thì địch nó có một trung đoàn cho nên không có thể chống lại nó được chúng tôi chỉ ở vùng cao vùng cái người cao ấy là nó ở dưới nhưng mà chúng tôi bắn cái đồ, à, tiểu lên nó bắn thì con chó với là mấy cái thằng bề trước thì chết được ba bốn thằng sau khi nó vay nhiều quá thì chúng tôi cũng bắn hết đạn là nó gần là bắn gần là bắn cũng chết nhiều ngày chúng tôi bắn hết đạn thì sau khi nếu mà không được tôi là trưởng tán tôi mới từ từ tôi mới lấy súng thì thằng con chó bốn con chó con chó à, con chó khỉ quân khỉ của mông cổ con chó của mông cổ thế nó cặp lấy súng tôi giờ nào không biết nó nhảy nhàng lắm súng ở trong này không biết nhưng mình nó sắp từ từ đó what year was that? So they put you in the Hanoi Hilton in the, in the prison in Hanoi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bắt đầu máy bay bắn phá thì máy bay 12 ngày đêm á, B-52 á. Mm. Thế 12 ngày đêm bắn phá thì chúng tôi ở thế này thì nó cũng khóa hết. Khóa trường tay khóa hết rồi. Mà phòng hai người, phòng hai người đó, một dãy dài rồi. Sau khi máy bay bắn phá ở đây nát hết rồi chúng tôi không được gì. Mà cán bộ xem chúng tôi bị thương, nó khiêm đi hết. How many years were you in prison? Tất cả là tôi... Um, Tháng 6 năm 63 và là tháng 1 năm 85 mới thả tôi về. How much of that time was in solitary confinement? Ồ, về làm từ lâu lắm um, cũng... cũng um, Anh bị tất cả 20 năm mấy năm. Về làm thì có như là 19 năm á. 
Sau khi nó bảo giải phóng Sài Gòn mới cho chúng tôi ra ngoài mới thấy mặt trời ở thế mà. So as you can see from the video clips, Mr. L ties his current symptoms of leg pain and weakness to his experience of imprisonment and torture many decades ago. And despite the fact that he'd been followed in this hospital for uh, years, uh, and decades actually, uh, this history didn't come out until his primary care physician specifically asked him about it, uh, the origin of his symptoms. And so from here, we're going to use this case as a jumping off point to discuss, uh, first of all, what is torture and how is it defined? Next, who should be screened and how? Uh, next, how is it relevant to current issues? And then finally, how to use the information that you obtain uh, in, regarding a patient's history of torture to further their medical care. First of all, what is torture? Uh, torture is defined by the World Medical Association Declaration of Tokyo as the deliberate, systematic, or wanton infliction of physical or mental suffering by one or more persons acting alone or on the orders of any authority to force another person to yield information, to make a confession, or for any other reason. So to highlight just like some of the key points on this definition, it's a deliberate act. So it's not a, a random act of violence such as a, a bombing or uh, something resulting in mass casualty, but a deliberate act against an individual or group. Uh, it can result in physical or mental suffering, and it's perpetrated by somebody in a position of authority, such as a government official, a police officer, uh, or a, a member of a militia in the place where there is no uh, function government that's able to stop them. And contrary to Hollywood notions, torture is not limited to interrogation to uh, find out information or to yield a confession, but it can be really for any other reason. For some background, uh, sadly nearly half of the world's 200 nations are known to practice torture. And it's estimated that somewhere between 6 to 12 percent of immigrants from those countries have a history of torture. Uh, the numbers are much higher in uh, asylum seekers, and in certain countries, uh, in particular Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Tibet, and Bhutan, the numbers are thought to be up to 20 to 40 percent of asylum seekers having a history of torture, uh, and perhaps numbers even higher in other countries, such as uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And, of course, numbers are hard to come by, but it's estimated that there are somewhere in the order of 500,000 torture survivors living in the U.S. currently. So this next section will talk briefly about some of the common me methods of torture to gain familiarity on what some of your patients may have suffered. So number one, uh, beatings, and particularly traumatic brain injury, are extremely common. A uh, phalanja is a different uh, specific type of beating that refers to beating on the soles of the feet, often with a thin rod, and this can cause uh, severe pain as well as chronic problems such as fascial thickening, chronic neuropathy, and difficulty with gait. Waterboarding and uh, other types of asphyxiation are also somewhat common. Burns. Uh, as you can see from these pictures, uh, this can range from cigarette burns to uh, a practice called necklacing, in which a, ga a tire is filled with gasoline and put around a person and ignited. Uh, detention is also extremely common as a method of torture. And this can involve detaining people without cause for prolonged periods of time. Uh, either in isolation or in extremely crowded cells, as in this picture. Uh, there can be deprivation of basic necessities, such as food and water. People can be subjected to extreme temperatures and have little to no ventilation, and there can be lack of access to medical care. Forced postures is also another form of torture that's practiced, where people are uh, subjected to uh, being placed in uncomfortable positions for a long time. Uh, sexual torture is a broad category uh, that includes acts such as rape, sodomy, direct genital torture, and female genital cutting. Uh, this is unfortunately very common in certain parts of the world, um, particularly uh, currently in the Democratic Republic of the Congo where rape is used as a weapon of war. 
uh, mental torture. So as mentioned before, torture extends just beyond uh, physical uh, and also into mental torture, which for some patients can be uh, just as debilitating or even more so long term. Um, forms of mental torture can include humiliation, mock executions, uh, psychoactive compounds, threats to the person or to their family members, uh, being forced to consume, consume human flesh or excrement, urine or blood, uh, or being forced to witness or perpetrate the torture of others. So we'll move on from there to the next section about who should be screened for a history of torture and how to do this. So who to screen? As you could probably guess, the prevalence among refugees and asylum seekers is much higher than that of the general population and higher than that of uh, general immigrant uh, immigrants as a group. Other, place, other people to, uh, to screen include those people from uh, countries where torture is known to be practiced who have unexplained physical scarring, unexplained physical symptoms such as chronic pain, headaches, uh, back pain, as well as those with psychiatric symptoms of trauma such as depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. This slide lists the, uh, the refugee arrivals by country of nationality in 2012. And in 2012 alone, the United States resettled about 58,000 refugees from all around the world. And these are the top 10 countries where they came from. So first, Bhutan and so on down, Burma, Iraq, Somalia, Cuba, the DRC, Iran, Eritrea, Sudan, Ethiopia. And these notably are all, are all countries where torture is known to be habitually practiced. So this slide lists refugee arrivals by state of residence. And these are the states where they were initially resettled. Out of those 58,179 refugees, these are the top 10 states. In Washington, uh, here uh, where we are, in 2012 resettled 2,165 new refugees, over half of those going to King County. And though I don't have numbers, many, uh, I'm willing to bet many of them at some point during their stay will cross the doors at Harborview, either in emergency room care or primary care or subspecialty care. As far as how and what to ask a patient to elicit this difficult history, uh, here are some examples of, of things that might be helpful or, or ways to ask. Uh, so sometimes I'll say, some people in your situation have experienced torture, or some people from your uh, country or in your uh, from your area have experienced torture. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, another way is to ask by the definition, such as, uh, did you ever experience physical or mental suffering that was deliberately afflicted by a soldier, policeman, or militant, or someone acting with government approval? Uh, this can be helpful since when asked uh, just uh, point blank, have you ever been tortured? Oftentimes patients will say no uh, because what happened to them, they may not even identify as torture. It may have been so common and widespread, it was just something that was done to everybody. Um, so asking specifics such as, have you ever been arrested or put in jail? Have you ever been detained? That can be helpful. And finally, another way uh, to ask is just as a routine part of social history, um, in what country were you born? And then uh, can you tell me what made you leave? And oftentimes, uh, uh, history will come out uh, when describing a, pa uh, a refugee's flight from their home country to the camp and so on to where they are now. So in this next section, we'll talk a little bit about how a history of torture is relevant to a patient's present complaints. Perhaps one of the most important ways a history of torture, even remote torture in the past, can come to play in the patient's med current medical care is the issue of non-adherence. And this torture survivor from Uganda summed it up this way. When I came to the United States in the early 1980s, my nightmares got worse. The hospital setting brought back bad memories, and it was difficult to tell people what had really gone wrong with me. The doctors never asked questions about the source of my nightmares, but gave me medication anyway. Eventually, I did not take the medications prescribed. So beyond just the issues of medication non-adherence, uh, torture survivors may also have increased uh, difficulty with follow-through on other things, such as follow-through on labs, 
studies, uh, referrals, and uh, making it to appointments. Another way that a uh, patient's history of torture can come to play in, in their current concerns is the, the issues of chronic and non-anatomic, or what we'll call non-anatomic pain. So it's pretty well established that torture survivors compared to their non-tortured immigrant counterparts have a much increased incidence of chronic pain. Uh, and in one study, it was reported that 78% of uh, torture survivors report chronic pain in multiple areas of their body, uh, the most common sites being chronic headaches and chronic back pain. Uh, so in addition to there being chronic pain, there's also this issue of non-anatomic non pain. And what I mean by this is pain that is in areas of the body that w wouldn't otherwise be connected in a biomedical uh, or anatomic sense, but pain that is created pain patterns that's created by a patient's specific torture experience. An example of this is in the case we started with, Mr. L, he had chronic leg pain that was worsened by poor sleep and worsened by uh, hunger. And if we didn't know his torture history, it would be confusing to say the least, and uh, we, we would have no idea why that would be so. But knowing what happened with him and knowing his torture history, uh, it makes it very apparent why that would be the case. The next way a torture history has relevance to chronic issues is the idea of diminished body awareness. And these next couple slides are courtesy of uh, Laura Guerin, a physical therapist at the Center for Victims of Torture. Um, and these are her recreations of drawings that torture survivors drew uh, when she asked them to draw a picture of themselves depicting their physical symptoms. And if you could imagine um, for yourself or for your patients what you might draw, uh, say if you had a headache or you had back pain, uh, imagine that in your head for a minute, minute and then look at these next few drawings. And so this is one torture survivor. This is the picture that they drew. And so noticeably, of course, is that they, their head is detached uh, from the rest of the body. Uh, perhaps signifying uh, feeling disconnected or um, uh, separate or detached from their physical uh, symptoms. And then also there's some emphasis on the feet. So it's hard to tell if the feet are swollen or if those are shoes or uh, if they're bleeding. This is a patient who suffered phalangia torture or beatings of the soles of the feet. This is another drawing done by a different torture survivor depicting his or her physical symptoms. And it's interesting to note in this photo, or this drawing, that uh, the form is just an amorphous shape. and It's not even a human type form. And so, and it's, if you imagine that this is the way a person is viewing themselves, and you can see why it would be difficult sometimes for a patient to characterize this is the exact location of my pain, this is what makes it better or worse, and to answer some of the typical questions that we as physicians would ask to characterize pain. Another way that a trauma history is important, and perhaps one of the most important reasons it's, uh, it's essential to know about a person's torture history is the issue of re-traumatization. So we worry sometimes when we're asking patients about their difficult past, whether we're actually making things worse or re-traumatizing patients. And the answer is, uh, it's hard to say and maybe sometimes yes, but it's also important to know that by not knowing, we might be inadvertently re-traumatizing a patient all the time, simply by us being in the medical setting. And the reasons for this is that torture is somewhat pseudo-medical by nature. There's procedures that are done to people, there's administration of drugs, there's supervision or even performing of torture by physicians. An example of this is uh, the practice of forced abortions and forced IUD placement done in China. Uh, and so if we didn't know a patient's torture history and they come to us uh, for some of these, for say a women's health issue, there is the potential uh, to do a great deal of harm. But by knowing, we can perhaps mitigate some of the, uh, the potential for re-traumatization. 
torture is also relevant because of all of the psychiatric comorbidities uh, that are closely associated, such as depression and PTSD. In addition to those, uh, there are higher rates of substance abuse and domestic violence, uh, at least anecdotally noted in uh, survivors of torture and their families. Um, so then in the next section, we'll talk about uh, how to use a patient's torture history to further their medical care. An important way that the, this history can be used is to anticipate and prevent re-traumatization. And we talked about this briefly in the previous section, how the medical setting can re-traumatize uh, people who have a difficult torture past. And the following are some pictures of, of examples of this. And so in this, in these photos you can see on the left asphyxiation and on the right uh, a routine central line placement. And this can go for any procedure, uh, but the, with a full cover drape. So for a patient who has been uh, tortured by asphyxiation, this can obviously trigger some memories of the past. Next, positional torture. Uh, and then asking a patient who's undergone this to go through the MRI scanner and hold still for a prolonged amount of time uh, with loud, unfamiliar noises all around. Next, electrical torture, uh, which I didn't mention before, but is also somewhat common as a method of torture. And for patients who've undergone that and then end up in the emergency room with chest pain and get hooked up to an EKG or get referred for EMGs, uh, this can also be traumatic. Uh, another thing that I hadn't considered before uh, that can re-traumatize torture survivors is the issue of dieting or being NPO. And this is something we counsel patients about on at least a daily basis. In the clinic, uh, losing weight, working on diet, and in the hospital, people are made NPO for almost any reason and for prolonged amounts of time for procedures and such. For patients who have undergone starvation, uh, this can be a reminder and, and bring back memories that are very painful. And I had a Cambodian patient who I inadvertently re-traumatized when I counseled her to work on her diabetes by exercising, by losing weight, watching what she eats. Uh, and this for her brought back memories of suffering under the Khmer Rouge for years. And at, uh, under this regime, she lost several of her children to starvation. Uh, and this is something that I didn't realize at the time. And of course, this isn't to say that we can't counsel our patients on diet and exercise and can't send them to the scanner, but just that if we know their history, that we can pre prepare them for uh, the potential uh, uh, flashbacks and be able to mitigate the harm. Another way that we can use knowledge of a patient's torture history uh, for their benefit is to give control back to patients as best as we can. Uh, and I like this quote uh, from Center of Victims for Torture that says, empowerment is a fundamental principle of psychological recovery. And this is true for uh, in the patient's interface with the medical system as well. And of course, this goes for all patients, but particularly in torture survivors who have experienced an incident in their lives, or maybe multiple incidents where all control and power was stripped away from them, uh, can be beneficial for them uh, to be handed some power or control back. And so this can be done even in small ways in the clinic by uh, asking their permission before examining them, by allowing them some input when possible on the timing of, of studies, such as uh, timing of labs, uh, referrals, and even emphasizing their uh, control over whether or not they take the me their medications, putting things in their hands. And of course, we'd like them to take their medications regularly, and uh, we emphasize our recommendations as physicians. Uh, but even to acknowledge that in the end it is up to them and they are the uh, they're in control of their own um, their own plan their own health so educating patients on prognosis for survivors of torture particularly refugees 
there's the belief that once they arrive in the United States, their symptoms of torture, their chronic pain or nightmares or depression, uh, that those symptoms should improve on their own. And oftentimes the reverse is, is true, that uh, when they arrive in the United States, there's a paradoxical worsening of symptoms. And uh, many people underestimate the stress of resettlement and all the additional pressures uh, that brings and how that can sometimes be enough to trigger uh, things that happened in the remote past. It can be helpful to describe a patient's torture-related symptoms as a chronic disease uh, and to let patients know that there will be times where they will flare up and there will be times where, there be, where they will be relatively quiescent and to anticipate that. Uh, in the Center for Victims of Torture's uh, publication, Healing the Hurt, uh, it says, it is important for trauma survivors to understand the common association between stresses and symptom exacerbation so that they do not perceive their treatment as ineffective and understand that their increased symptoms will gradually diminish over time. That can be incredibly reassuring for patients to hear. So in summary, uh, torture has a high prevalence in immigrants, particularly in refugee and asylum seeker populations. Next, uh, knowing this torture history can help explain some chronic physical symptoms and psychiatric symptoms. Uh, such as chronic pain, uh, depression, PTSD. And finally, knowing a torture history can help pre prevent re-traumatization that's somewhat inherent in the medical setting. So we'll close there. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, please feel free to contact me with questions. Thanks.